Grace, peace, and mercy are yours. From God our Father, and from our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning our sermon is based on our gospel lesson, which comes to us from Matthew chapter 4, beginning with the 12th verse. And I invite you to rise for the reading. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, and the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were, casting, they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. These are your words, O Heavenly Father, therefore we know that they are the truth. And we ask that you would increase our faith through them. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is your biggest fear? What's the one thing that, that just makes your skin crawl, that makes your stomach turn over and the hair on the back of your neck stand up straight? Some of the most common phobias are things like spiders, maybe small enclosed spaces or, or snakes, or maybe you're afraid of heights. There was a fear that was very common among people in, in ancient times that does not exist in our society anymore. It was something that, that didn't just, it was a fear that didn't just grip a single person. It, it gripped an entire culture, a nation, and many of them. It was a fear of a solar eclipse. Now it sounds strange and a little ridiculous, but if you put yourself in their shoes, it kind of makes sense. You know that, that the sun gives you light, it gives you warmth, it makes plants grow. The sun is, is, your, is, your, sense of, is your source of, of warmth. You count on it each morning to rise on and each night to set. It's a constant thing that you, can, that you can bet on. And then suddenly, in the middle of the day, something starts encroaching on the sun. It starts to block it out and it becomes a bigger and bigger obstacle until the night turns to darkness. Now, there were a lot of ancient cultures that came up with uh, different explanations of what was happening when these solar eclipses is were occurring. The most common was that some giant creature or force was, was trying to devour it. And most often it was a dragon who was trying to consume the sun. It was a terrifying thing for these people because they knew the destruction of the sun meant their destruction. They would do whatever they could to try and stop this dragon from eating the sun. They would throw rocks into the air or shoot arrows at the sun or make loud noises and, and bang pots trying to scare off this creature. What would inevitably happen was that the moon would pass by the sun and eventually would no longer block their view of the light. They believed that this dragon was again defeated by the sun and they would, what would follow was a huge party, a great celebration of rejoicing that the sun had won. They would enjoy its warmth and its light again. Now thanks to our understanding of astronomy, we no longer have to worry about dragons devouring our sun, but that also means that we have to miss out on the, the party that would follow an eclipse. Now, I think that we can get a kind of a sense of, of what they felt, that relief uh, as, as Minnesotans in this frigid winter that just seems to never let up. We get days like Friday where it, it gets a little bit above freezing and we rejoice in the warmth. In the, even though it's, it's barely above freezing, we, we can feel that warmth and we know that spring again is going to return. Just a sense of relief. 
Sunshine truly is an amazing thing. In our text for this morning, our, our gospel text, we hear how our, how our Old Testament lesson, the prophecy of Isaiah, was fulfilled. A prophecy that told how people who were standing in darkness would see a great light. Who were these people that saw a great light? It was the, the, the people of the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. That clears it up, doesn't it? Well, just to give a little background, these were two tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were in the, the northern kingdom. And when Jesus was alive during his time, their geographical area was known as Galilee. So Jesus, when he heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he retreated to this area, to Galilee, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, by the time Jesus got to this area, there wasn't just Jews or, or Israelites living in this land. These people, many, from many years before, were, were, they were suffering the consequences of, of not obeying God's command. The Canaanites had, had started to encroach in the promised land, and God said, drive these people out. But instead of driving them out, these, these people in this area welcomed them. They actually intermarried with them. And as a result, the Canaanites brought with them their religion, their false gods, their false idols, their heathen practices. When Scripture talks about darkness, it, it refers to evil and sin and wickedness. It refers to unbelief. It describes well the state of the people living in this region. They truly were living in darkness. Of course, this description didn't just fit these people in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. It fit almost all the Jewish people. If it wasn't the Canaanites bringing in their, their, their false ideas of, of, of religion and of false gods, it was them believing that, that, they, that their God loved them because of what they did. That their God loved them because they could fulfill the law. They were good enough people to earn righteousness. It was their idea that they could earn God's love simply because they were descendants of Abraham. These people had lost the truth of the gospel. The light of that gospel truly did still remain. It was still written for them in the, in the Old Testament lessons that they had written down for them in the prophecies of Scripture. But that light of truth was eclipsed by their own ideas of how they could be saved. How are we different than the people of the Jews of Jesus' time? Truly, we as Christians stand in the true light of the gospel. We understand that we are saved by grace through faith alone. But what kind of things block out the light of the gospel? What kind of things are our eclipses? Is it worry? Stressing out about things that could go wrong in our life, go wrong with our being fired from our job or, or losing a loved one or anything that, that could go wrong? Not trusting in the promises of God to, to be with us, to protect us and to bless us through all things? Is it sin? Is it loving a, a specific pet sin so much that you ignore God's law condemning that specific sin so that you can indulge in it without feeling quite so guilty? Is it money? The desire to earn more and more so you can buy more and more and have more and more earthly possessions? Is it simple neglect of our Bibles? When we do that, when we think that we have learned enough. When we think Bible study on Sunday morning has nothing new to teach us or, or that our children learn or get enough spiritual food during the sermon on Sunday morning and that Bible study for them is, is superfluous, it's redundant or unnecessary. When we just don't have enough time to spend with God in His Word, we are choosing to walk in darkness. We're refusing the light that can guide us throughout our lives. Anyone who has or has had little kids and has walked through a dark room in the middle of the night and has stepped on a Lego, or anyone who's stubbed their toe knows that walking in darkness can be dangerous. And that's speaking physically. Spiritually, it's even more true. What's so amazing is that the light of the gospel, just like how the sun can pierce through the clouds and warm us on a cold day, the light of the gospel can cut straight through our darkness. God's law can convict us of our sinful ways, of our, of our sinful actions with a single 
passage. It can make us realize that, that we're sinners. That we should not be trying to block out that light. That we should be embracing it. That we should be seeking it each and every day in God's word. Jesus once called himself the light of the world. When you picture Jesus as the light of the world, don't picture him walking around on earth as, as some kind of glowing person. Don't picture him as, as a flashlight in your life or, or as even a bright searchlight. Picture him as the sun itself. See, Jesus didn't come to earth to, to live a perfect life, to shine a light on the deeds that we have to do to earn forgiveness. He came to do them for us. When we were born into darkness, that darkness was all consuming. We had no hope of, of finding our own way out. We couldn't just decide or choose to say, I'm no longer going to be in the darkness. We couldn't decide, hey, I'm now going to be in the light. When Jesus lived, he lived perfectly. When he died, he died innocently. He took on his shoulders every sin that you've ever committed. And when that, that knowledge was placed into your heart, that, that faith, that same faith that, that the disciples knew centuries ago, God dragged you out of the pit of darkness that you were living in and dragged you into his marvelous light. We were doomed to spend an eternity in the darkness of hell. But thanks to what the Holy Spirit did inside of our hearts, thanks to what Jesus won for us, there was innocent life and death. We're now destined for something else. We are destined, and we know for certain that we will stand in the marvelous light of heaven with our Lord forever. The sun truly is a powerful force. Even during the nighttime when it's on the other side of the earth, it still provides light. It reflects off the moon, a thing that has no light source of its own, and it shines as if it did. We look up at the stars and it's hard to tell what's a planet and what's actually a star because even the planets reflect the light of the sun and shine as bright as the stars do. When we think about our Lord as the sun, as we think about him giving off that light of life, we know that that, that light reflects off of us as well. A light that doesn't come from within us, but a light that is shined on us from God himself. The second part of our text today talks about Jesus calling his disciples into the full-time ministry, into bringing the light that was shined on them to the corners of the earth, to put down their nets that catch fish, and instead to become fishers of men. These men had a huge impact on the history of the world, and they had a big impact on you, too. They did bring this light to the corners of the earth, and this message was passed down from generation to generation until it reached you, until it reached your ears, until this powerful message created faith in your heart. A light was shined in your spiritual darkness. God has called us as believers to reflect this light as well. In everything we do, in how we act, and how we speak, and how we think throughout our entire earthly life. We can reflect this light in, in simple but very meaningful ways. In ways like how we speak in, in front of our friends or in front of our, our co-workers. Not tearing people down when, when they're not with us, but building them up, protecting their name, protecting their reputation. Not giving in to the culture of, of bad language that is set in many workplaces. People notice these things and, and they notice that there's something different about us. We can reflect that light when we go out of our way to help other people. In very simple ways. When we go out of our way to help our own family, help our friends, and even help our, our enemies. When we put ourselves second and others first. We do it when we show people that even in hard times, even when we suffer great losses, when we're, when we're down, when there's a time of great sadness, we still have joy and we still have hope. Because we have the light. This light makes people interested. It opens opportunities. It opens doors for you to talk to others about your faith. About spirituality in general. It gives you an opportunity to present them with the truth. And we as Lutherans were very protective 
of true and pure doctrine. This is wonderful. This is great that we are, because we have seen church after church give in on, on one doctrine here, or one passage of scripture here, one teaching from God's word. And then that creates a cascade, and soon they are standing in, the, in an eclipse of false doctrine. They lose the heart of the gospel. But since we're so protective about, about, our, our, about the true doctrines of Scripture, we're very careful in how we talk to other people about Jesus. And sometimes it can make us nervous to do that. We feel like we have to start out with, with the fall into sin, with creation, and talk about how all have fallen into sin, then move on to the, the major and the minor prophets and how they prophesied the Lord's birth, and then move on to, to the virgin birth and the two natures of Christ. And then his active and passive obedience and his life and death and what his resurrection means for us. And then we can say, and now you too are forgiven. That forgiveness is offered to you as well. But to reflect the light that, that God has shined on us, we don't need a degree in theology or in doctrine. You all as, as believers know the truths that are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You know that, that we are all sinful, but that the blood of Christ covers all unrighteousness. And this is the message that you can bring to other people. You can share with them the light of the gospel message that brings comfort and hope and so much joy. You can invite them to Bible study or, or to, to church on Sunday morning. And through you, through introducing this person to the word of God, the Holy Spirit can drag that person out of the pit of their darkness and into the wonderful light of faith. Not because you were convincing enough. Not because you did such a good job of presenting the gospel message. It actually has nothing to do with you at all. But simply because they heard the powerful word of God. A word that God promises will never return to him empty. The light of salvation. The Holy Spirit worked faith in that person's heart. We know that we stand in the light of life, the light that, a light that is the light of forgiveness as well. We know that no matter what sin we have committed, even if it's the sin of, of hiding our light, being ashamed of it, and not letting it reflect the light that has shined on us, we can retreat out of that darkness and back into the marvelous light of Christ's forgiveness. We can run back to the foot of the cross, the gospel promise in his word that says that his forgiveness is never ending. It's all encompassing and it's eternal. The knowledge of that forgiveness comforts us. It warms our souls. And it's our motivation for, for telling others this wonderful message. A message that when we share, we don't get any less of it. They just get it in its full measure as well. A message that, that can open up the gates to an eternity with the light of the world himself. An eternity that we know is ours. An eternity that is guaranteed to us through faith in Jesus. The one who shines a light in our darkness. Amen.